Sweet potatoes are one of Louisiana's signature commodities. And this year, in 2024, we are celebrating the 75th anniversary of the LSU Ag Center Sweet Potato Research Station. The station was established in 1949, and since its establishment, it has helped to sustain the profitability of the Louisiana sweet potato industry through service, science, and improved varieties and technologies. Our sweet potato research and extension team in the LSU Ag Center is dedicating to meeting the needs of the Louisiana and national sweet potato industries. We hope that the information that we are providing you makes a difference on your farms every day and is truly increasing your sustainability. We're really excited about the research we have ongoing. Our sweet potato research team has multi-state projects looking at nematicides and, and nematode uh, resistance looking at keeping virus tested seed clean and looking at heavy metal uh, work. We also have ongoing research looking at improving our breeding lines as well as agronomic practices and looking into best management practices in weed science and insecticides and entomology. So if you have any questions about any of the things that were presented here in this video or any of the other ongoing research we have, I encourage you to reach out to us at the LSU Sweet Potato Research Station and we'll be happy to visit with you and try to disseminate any of this information to you. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Tristan Watson. I am the Assistant Professor of Nematology here at LSU Egg Center. And here I'm gonna give you a update on some of the work that we've been doing on nematode management in sweet potatoes. Uh, so I'm gonna be talking about some of the work we've been doing with nematicides, taking a look at different chemistries and how we apply them. I'm gonna talk about some of the newer work we're doing on reniform nematode management. So that's one of our main pests that we have here in the sweet potato fields. And then I'm gonna wrap up with a little bit of a uh, overview of what we've been doing with the Sweet Armor Project, which is a USDA NEFA specialty crop research initiative project that was funded three years ago. So with respect to nematicides, over the past couple of years, we've been looking at non-fumigant nematicides and comparing them to what is our, our gold standard uh, fumigant, which is Telone 2. Uh, this year, we decided to expand the fumigant side of it. We had some growers that were interested in KPAM, VAPAM, some of these telone alternatives for, uh, as a soil fumigant. Uh, that's something that we've been looking into this past year, so we do have some on-farm uh, trials looking at this. Uh, we don't have yield data yet, of course, but so far, telone and uh, KPAM have been performing uh, very closely, so we do perhaps have some alternatives to telone. We've also been looking at some of the non-fumigant nematicides, and uh, we've also seen some pretty good performance. Uh, by about 28 days into the growing season, we do see significant suppression of renifor nematode numbers. So this year, one of the things we're looking at is how to best apply these various non-fumigant nematicides. They can be applied various ways. We can apply them broadcast over the entire field, over the beds. We can apply them in furrow, right where we're gonna be planting our slips. And we can also do something new, which is a transplant drench application where we concentrate the chemical right where the slips are actually being planted. So we're taking a look at how this impacts the performance of particular chemistries and how it impacts nematode suppression with ultimately providing our growers with the best uh, application methods for particular compounds. So one of the newer projects that we started this year is on reniform nematode management and specifically using host resistance. Uh, so we've done some work on nematicides and we've seen some suppression of reniform nematode, but really what we want is resistant varieties that will not allow the nematode to uh, reproduce. So we're starting to look at some of the commercial varieties that we currently have available. We're gonna see their susceptibility to reniform nematode. Perhaps there is resistance already available in some of the commercial lines. This is something we haven't looked at before. And if we don't find resistance, we're gonna start looking into some of the breeding lines with the hope of developing resistant varieties in the near future. And finally, I wanna discuss a project that we started about three years ago called Sweet Armor. Uh, the, uh, the whole point of this project is to develop management tactics and resistant uh, sweet potato varieties to root knot nematodes. Not just Meloidogyne incognita, the southern root knot nematode that we have in fields around here, but also the guava root knot nematode, Meloidogyne entrelobii, that invasive new pest that we're keeping a very close eye on. Over the past three years, we have uh, breeding lines that now have very strong resistance to both these pests, and they're working their way through uh, to release. Uh, the idea is to move these forward and release them as new resistant varieties. And just this past year, we released a new variety called Avoils with very strong resistance to the southern root knot nematode. We hope this information is useful for you. Uh, if there are any particular research areas that you'd like us to look at, email us, text us, call us, and let us know, and we're, we're more than happy to take a look at it. And the final thing is I want everyone to uh, take a look at their fields, pull some soil samples, send them to the nematode advisory service, because this is how you determine if you do have nematode issues. 
Storage information is the most economically important developmental process in the sweet potato. Understanding the internal and external variables that influence storage information is important in developing and testing management practices to ensure optimum and consistent yields. External variables include moisture, temperature, fertilizer, and heavy metals. Internal variables are mostly variety effects. Our goal is to understand the role of these variables in optimizing storage information. For example, we want to understand variety-specific requirements for water. We want to ensure that the right amount of water is applied at the right time. We also want to understand variety-specific requirements for fertility. We want to ensure that growers are able to provide fertilizers at the right amount and the right timing. Our overarching goal is to ensure the economic sustainability of our growers and industry by providing them with the most up-to-date, field-specific and variety-specific management practices. Hi, I'm Imana Power, and today I want to tell you a little bit more about the research we do at the Sweet Potato Pathology Lab. We work really close with Dr. Labonte, the sweet potato breeder, on screening his advanced breeding lines for multiple disease resistance. And we're also part of the National Clean Plant Network, the uh, Louisiana Center, to make sure we have clean, virus-tested planting material available for sweet potato um, producers, particularly in Louisiana. Today I want to focus on two projects. One is the abiotic stress in sweet potato production, in particular late season floods. Um, we know that extreme weather events happen in shorter times. So the 2016 flood that happened and then in 2022 um, we had another flood that basically was detrimental for the sweet potato producers. The answers they want to have is can, what do we need to do when there is a late season flood? Can we leave it, the sweet potato in or do we go ahead and harvest? If we harvest, what can we then do? Do we cure longer, more? Do we send the sweet potato immediately for um, processing or what? Those are questions we need to answer. So we have a project going on where we can find um, indicators that can tell us the risk. And with those risks, we can then help find decision um, um, support systems or develop decision support systems that will answer, help answer those questions for the farmers where they can independently figure out what to do when a flood like that happens. The other project we're working on is basically finding, determining the distribution of pathogens or in particular sweet potato pathogens that cause soft rot in packing houses and storage facilities of sweet potato producers. We um, are aware that Botran is no longer um, produced, so we need to have alternatives for those uh, packers and storage facilities. What we want to find is using spore traps in those facilities and quantify, so find how many and what type of uh, pathogens we have in these facilities and how it is linked to the, the practices of the packers and producers. So is there, um, do we have more distributions of these pathogens after they fill the packing houses? Um, when they start bedding, when, once they have cleaned or sanitized their facilities or what? And which ones do we find in what distribution? We hope that once we have that answer, we can then identify which of the chemistries, the newer chemistries, will have a better effect to um, reduce that so that they can have a cleaner, a clean facility even after Botran is completely outfaced. Another area I want to highlight is the using hyperspectral imaging to, deter, to distinguish virus infected from healthy plants, the sweet potato plants. Um, we have a graduate student, Clayton Blake, who's working on it, and he's making great progress in the greenhouse, and we want to see if we can extend it to a field um, uh, situation. I want to thank the sweet potato producers, the industry, and the Sweet Potato Commission for, for helping us and supporting our research at the LSU Ag Center. Hello, my name is Jeff Davis. I'm an entomologist with the LSU Ag Center, and today I'm going to be talking about our clean seed project. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about uh, keeping the seed clean once we put it out in the field. So my part and what I'm doing and what we're going to talk about today is using some of our soybean crop field borders around our sweet potatoes. As someone told me the other day, 
these soybeans can act as soldiers for our sweet potatoes. They're protecting the sweet potatoes and they do so by keeping the plants of the sweet potato themselves from getting a virus. So viruses are being transmitted by aphids. Those aphids land on the soybeans first. They do so because the aphids look for contrast between the soil surface and the green of the plants. By surrounding the sweet potatoes with soybeans, we then have those aphids land first on the soybeans. The soybeans are not hosts for the viruses that we're interested in in sweet potato. Those are sweet potato feathery model virus. Those are sweet potato virus G, sweet potato virus C, and sweet potato virus 2. Those are non-persistent during transmitted viruses. They are transmitted by aphids. The aphids land on the soybeans. They probe. And as they're probing, they'll lose those the viruses from their style at mouth parts. When they then do move to the sweet potato, as long as the sweet potato has no viruses, those aphids cannot reacquire a virus or transmit. The tools and techniques that we're going to be using, I mentioned the crop borders like soybeans. We're also using the insecticides or they can be different kinds of non-insecticidal products that might reflect or change that landing behavior of aphids. So for instance, we're using Savanto Prime. That's gonna be our insecticide. Now in the past, insecticides have not been very effective against non-persistent viruses, but it's always good to try. Uh, in addition, we're using a product called Surround. This is a kale and clay product. So much like it's a whitewash for our plants, by whitewashing the plants, that changes that color spectrum. Those aphids, when they're looking to land on the plant, will actually move away from that whitewash and land elsewhere. And then in addition, we're trying some uh, inducers of plant resistance that can try to help keep those sweet potatoes clean and healthy. So once again, Clean Seed Project, our project is to start clean, stay clean. We're using the crop borders, different tools and techniques within the sweet potato itself. Thank you very much. Hey, what we'll be doing during the field day uh, tomorrow is we have an abbreviated demonstration of a larger trial that we're conducting at the Northeast Research Station in St. Joseph. And essentially what we're doing is we're trying to evaluate different varieties, those four varieties being Bayou Bell, of oils, Orleans, and Evangeline. We're trying to evaluate their inherent competitiveness against weeds based on their different growth characteristics, how quickly they can canopy and cover the row, provide shade to keep weeds from coming up, whether they grow tall or whether they just spread out, have a climbing growth habit. We're trying to, to see if one has a competitive advantage over the other against weeds. And we're doing this by going in after planting at select dates, keeping the plots weed free, for those dates, so either two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, we're keeping the plots weed free for that length of time. After that, we're letting the weeds repopulate naturally on their own. Again, we're trying to see two things with that. First of all, we're trying to see that any weeds that do come up after that weed free period, do the individual cultivars differ? Are they better able to uh, com compete and tolerate the weeds being there. Second of all, it's letting us measure a weed-free period. In other words, how long does a producer have to concentrate all his efforts on keeping those, his fields weed-free to be able to maximize his yield. Now that's not to say that he won't have weeds that pop up, won't affect harvest efficiency. They won't replenish the seed bank, so you have to worry about it there. But just to see how long they have to keep it weed free to maximize their yield. So that's essentially what we're doing. And the reason we're doing that is with the EPA's changes coming up with herbicides and uh, having a more stringent re-registration and a newly registration process on new herbicides and re-registered herbicides. And with the newly released herbicide strategy, uh, producers are gonna have maybe less options to use, maybe not be able to use the rates that they're normally used. And with the herbicide strategy, they're gonna have to include some mitigation efforts to accrue enough points to be able to use on each herbicide label, the newly herbicide label that, that comes out. So when we only have a handful, five herbicides that we can use in sweet potato, if we lose one, that's 20% of our arsenal down, much different than we have in other agronomic crops. So that's just a brief synopsis of what we'll be showing here and how it ties into a larger uh, trial we're doing at the research station in St. Joe. 
We don't release a sweet potato variety very often, but we came up with one recently this year, and it looks really great. And this is the Voiles variety, originally tested as 18100. What we really like about it is it's early. It has the capacity to produce really nice storage roots at 90 to 100 days. Uh, most sweet potato varieties are at 110, 120 days before you can really harvest it. And this is a big deal to our industry because very often this time of year in August, uh, into, we are looking at having um, shortages of sweet potatoes to be able to sell to the retail market. So having a variety that can come up out of the ground before the primary crop is a big deal for our industry. Also, the processing industry wants an early variety so they can begin processing fresh stock earlier in the season. One of the things we like about the 18100 is it's that 90 day um, yield on it. And that's not something you've come across very often. It also stores well. And that's also a characteristic we usually don't find with early, early yielding varieties. Um, one of the things that we do like about it, it's got a really nice sturdy plant to it. So when the growers put it out in the spring and the summer, um, it's got good survivability. One of the issues that we have with it though, is it does need to be what we call pre-sprouted. So the storage roots that you put out into the ground to get sprouts from, to produce your crop um, in the springtime, it needs to be, these roots need to be warmed up before they can be put out into the ground. So that's one of those little differences that we find with this variety than we have with others. We do everything at the LSU Ag Center Sweet Potato Research Station. We generate true seed, and this is a good example of a crossing nursery um, right behind me. Uh, we train these different lines, which we use to generate flowers. And during this, during this uh, time of year, starting to get into the fall period, um, bees will pollinate these flowers. And so we're gonna get tens of thousands of true seeds, not only here up at the sweet potato station, but also in Baton Rouge, where we have seven or eight, nine different crossing nurseries where we pick seed from. So this is the start of it all. Once we have the true seed from our crossing nurseries, and this is 10, 30,000 that we're, 10,000, 30,000 that we're gonna plant out each year, we put them out in the field and this is behind you is about an acre of lines that we're going to evaluate. So each one of these plants is a different individual. And we are, our job is to come in here, harvest them, and identify those few rare individuals that have the great shape, great yield, and great flavor that we're all looking for in a sweet potato variety. Just a couple will make it through the process. Those very few that we select over in that first year eventually can make it to this advanced line stage. So for instance, 1920 is the 20th selection we made in 2019. So you can see how very, very few make it through the process. So this is one we're real excited about. It's got a beautiful red skin on it, high yield, and oh my gosh, the flavor on it's just fantastic. So we got a lot of different kinds of sweet potatoes we're looking at to develop. And if we go down this long row, you can see a lot of numbers lines. And some of these have a lot of characteristics that we're looking for. Our main objective is to develop those delicious orange flesh sweet potatoes. But we got a lot of other demands for other kinds of sweet potatoes. For instance, purple flesh. So we have a number of different lines we're looking at that have that wonderful deep purple color in the flesh and also a good flavor. And those are a tough combination to get those two together. So 18115P, 21205P, these are all under evaluation as potential releases as a purple flesh. One of the categories that has really surprised me of how popular it is, is white flesh sweet potatoes. Um, our Murasaki variety was released a number of years ago. Oh my gosh, it's amazing how much is sold in the United States. But there's a lot of complaints with the, from the growers because it skins very easy. It's got a beautiful purple skin, but it's paper thin. And there's also the yields okay, but it's not as good as it could be. And so that's that constant pressure we have in the breeding program is to come up something that's bigger, better, and provides a better livelihood for our growers. And so we do have a few lines that are coming out that seem to have that tougher skin and also a delicious flavor and it's got a little bit more yield.